Hi, everybody. Welcome to CSSO SFO chapter. I just wanted to discuss about uh, C CSSFO vision and what we are trying to do. So we want to give back to the community and um, help ind individuals grow uh, by uh, training and also empower them. Um, innovation and research, we want to help them in uh, standards and certification. So we are a set of um, a set of uh, people who would like to um, help uh, the students as well as the community um, or the freshers uh, to understand more about cloud security and then export this um, uh, export this place. So some of the details on why why you need to join the chapter. So definitely networking with peers, uh, you will get to find subject matter experts. You can uh, um, talk to them. And uh, important thing is you can also contribute in uh, writing white papers as a group. Um, you can conduct in peer reviews, get access to uh, uh, white paper and trainings. Um, this is a, a lot of a huge resources is uh, available for everybody to explore. Um, so there are uh, quite a few training uh, training materials and white papers available, which you can, uh, which you can, which you can go through. Then um, gain valuable insight from the industry professionals. Discuss cloud security vulnerabilities and brainstorm solutions, and be a leader in cloud security field. So these are some of the benefits when you join the chapter. Uh, of course, code of, code of conduct, uh, professional behavior is expected, res uh, respectful and inclusive environment, um, responsible communication uh, we look for, and then communication with uh, laws and regulation. Now, uh, it is very important uh, in order to uh, in order to avail all these uh, opportunities, please join CSSFO chapter. This is the uh, LinkedIn, LinkedIn uh, um, uh, link, which you can um, join. I will share this later. Uh, and then you, uh, all you need to do is uh, log in. And then these are some of the benefits, which I already discussed. We also request you to join um, LinkedIn the second thing is inner circle uh, that is where you will get the white papers and other things to access and lastly uh, uh, our chapter um, linkedin uh, page so with that let's start this session uh, in this session Woody will uh, uh, so this is a five star chat on um, zero trust so Woody, uh, if you could take over he, he will be the moderator for this uh, session thank you so much Hello and welcome everyone uh, to this session on enabling zero trust architecture through least privilege. I have the privilege of being today's moderator. My name is Odie Gray. I'm president of Diversity Cyber Council, and I am joined with a all-star panel. Uh, we have uh, Satish, who is the uh, enterprise security architecture expert. We have Adil, who is the cloud architecture expert, and we have Abhishek, who is an expert in IAM. And we will be sharing insights on Zero Trust today and uh, ultimately um, just uh, explaining what the best Zero Trust strategy is to implement in a uh, virtual environment. So with that being said, I'd like to pass it to each person to do a brief introduction for those who don't already know you. So we'll start with uh, Satish. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, I didn't uh, introduce myself. Um, so I am Satish. I am chapter lead for uh, CSSFO. Um, I have around uh, 23 years of experience. Uh, uh, basically, I'm a security architect. Uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, I give you, uh, I do design reviews, uh, so check for threats. Um, in a way, it's more of a threat modeling, understand what is the risk, uh, provide the risk details to the this to, to the product teams and then help them um, help them help them build a secure product so this that is my um, role and i am very excited to be part of this uh, fireside chat thank you so much thank you satish next up arun hi guys uh, i am arun danaraj uh, i am working as a cloud and security architect in one of the uh, global financial bank so I have around uh, 15 years of experience in, uh, I mean, uh, cloud and technology and, you know, uh, on the security side. So I'm happy to participate on the Facha chat. 
Thank you, Arun. And last but not least, Abhishek. Hey, thanks, Sudhi. Um, so, hello, everyone. My name is Abhishek. Uh, I am founder and CEO of Atharva. Uh, it's a stealth mode startup. We just started with that effort uh, around access governance. Uh, before Atharva, I was working as director of uh, product management in identity and access management and compliance area with Salesforce for almost three years. Uh, in total, I have over a decade of experience in identity governance space. And I'm very excited to have this opportunity today to share my thoughts and experience with you on Zero Trust today. Absolutely. Thank you all. Much appreciated. So to get started, let's begin to provide a simplified definition of Zero Trust and the value of its implementation and adoption. Why is it an important practice in securing a digital environment, in your opinion, Abhishek? So uh, I mean, zero trust is a very, uh, you know, is a buzzword right now. Everybody is talking about it. It's been a couple of years, like in the entire industry, we in the security teams or people who are working with the security teams, it's a very popular keyword, right? Uh, especially, I mean, the reason is especially post pandemic, right? When people were working from home, uh, there was a mass migration of the workforce uh, outside the office. Uh, before that, everybody was going to, uh, you know, a particular physical location. They were set within the boundaries where they had to badge in and they had to log in into a VPN. And then they were, you know, working on the confined set of devices. That is not the scenario anymore. Uh, people now, you know, uh, today they are logging in from, uh, let's say, US. Then tomorrow they can go to South America. Then day after tomorrow, you can find them. Uh, you know, somewhere else in some other part of the world. So they are constantly on the move. And, uh, you know, now let's say if I'm, uh, my, for my employer, you know, I'm logging in as Abhishek uh, from some, uh, you know, my own device. And some employers have started supporting bringing your own device technology as well, right? How would they uh, make sure that, you know, I'm really Abhishek? I mean, when we talk about cybersecurity basics and principles, identification and authentication are the top two pillars, right, which we talk about. So how would my identity uh, be verified that I'm really a Bishak, right? So that is, that is where zero trust comes into the picture. Maybe, uh, you know, uh, it is a strategy in which uh, which just simply says that whatever your uh, users are trying to log in or authenticate or authorize, right? Continuously verify and validate. Just don't, uh, you know, don't do it one time thing and, you know, have a layer of multi-factor authentic authentication to be implemented around this whole thing, right? Uh, it really depends on how many layers you want uh, to apply for authentication uh, based on the critical nature of the asset they are trying to access. Uh, right, but uh, zero trust has become really, really more, uh, in, you know, important, and has actually become, uh, you know, relatively more mature in past couple of years because of these reasons. Wow, that was some great insight. And to add to that, I would say that honestly, the two biggest areas, in my opinion, of uh, as it relates to cyber risk is insider threat, which directly correlates to zero trust and uh, third party risk, which is quickly becoming one of the bigger risk areas. Uh, so I want to pass it to uh, Satish or Arun. Do you have any thoughts to expand upon um, <clears throat> why it is important and valuable to implement uh, zero trust to secure a digital environment? Yeah, I'll take, I'll take that. So, so uh, before, uh even getting there, I would like to step back a bit and then give an overview on uh, um, what are we talking about. So, so basically at the, so before getting into all these things, uh, sorry, a lot of people are uh, trying to attend and not able to, yeah, um, start meeting them. Okay, so before uh, uh, get uh, going further, I would like to discuss three concepts. Number one, what exactly we are trying to solve. Number two, and what is zero trust model? And uh, number three, how did Zero Trust model become uh, so, so famous? So starting with number one. So what are we trying to solve? We are trying to solve 
secure access between um, data and an object. So at, at the crux of uh, uh, the at the crux of uh, everything, it is uh, the data we are trying to protect from the objects. L let's take an example. For example, uh, a users a user want to access uh, his bank uh, bank balance uh, details. So bank balance details is a data. Now user is an object. Now how does he access securely? So in order to uh, there are multiple protocols and uh, protocols uh, and principles. Uh, so zero trust model is just one of them. In order to access securely any object, uh, it could be a user or it could be a web service or it could be it could be a, uh, anything. So whoever wants to access the data, they need to be uh, they need to be. Uh, uh, they, they should follow certain privileges and protocols. So this is at the root what exactly is happening. So zero trust is just one model. So we have a lot of models, but uh, zero trust is one uh, such model. So what is zero trust model? Uh, zero trust model was again, um, NIST came up with um, zero trust model. I mean, a lot of people initially had the uh, discussion, but uh, ultimately NIST, uh, they came up with, I think it's a, uh, um, 800-207 is the uh, publication which we did, which they did, and what it says. So NIST says that uh, so uh, following things are very important. One is uh, least privilege, and then give uh, least privilege again. Uh, give only access what what is required. I'll just summarize. I mean there are so many uh, principles. I'll just summarize some of them. Uh, one is least privilege. Second thing is uh, so even when you give access, it has to be monitored every now and then. It's not that you give access and that is the end of it. So you need to uh, monitor and then network segmentation. These are some of the concepts. They have some 10 to 15 principles. So what you need to do is if you are adhering to zero trust, you need to adhere that. So that is number two, which we need to understand. So what is zero trust? Number three, I want to talk about is how zero trust became so famous. I mean, it is just few things which was already there. Uh, privilege, uh, least privilege, everything are the similar same security concepts, but why zero trust became so famous. So once uh, they released uh, this paper, a couple of things happened. One is, uh, uh, this is my opinion actually. So uh, one of the major thing is uh, COVID. So during COVID, a lot of people uh, started working in remote. So, uh, the, the, that is that, that, that could be one of the main reason where um, the perimeter, the traditional way of perimeter security thing uh, was not, that model was not working, right? We have all our data centers um, protected by a perimeter and then people try to access it. Now, a lot of remote employees try to access that environment. Again, uh, it was overhead on the corporate network. Number two, uh, SaaS based projects, SaaS based products, sorry. So a lot of people uh, started using SaaS based products. That also, uh, that also resulted in, uh, uh, resulted in uh, network bandwidth. Uh, again, a uh, lot of latency uh, came into picture because they need to access the corporate network and then from there go to the SaaS based application. So, in order to, uh, so this is one, uh, the COVID. Second thing is uh, there was a, a federal, um, I think federal agency, there was an attack, uh, I think everybody would have heard, um, solar winds attack. So it was on supply chain. So basically what happened, uh, solar winds uh, attack, uh, the hackers were able to see the documents of uh, all the federal government agencies and or to some extent they were able to authorize it. So that was uh, uh, the major instance which made um, a federal uh, government to uh, roll out a mandate that by 2024, all the federal agencies must adhere to zero trust. So because of these instances, uh, zero trust model gained a lot of popularity. So these are the three things which I wanted to 
uh, talk about before getting into uh, what exactly uh, how how do you protect um, our least privilege? Yes, and and to add on to that, yeah. uh, in my opinion, I think least privilege is kind of the grandfather of zero trust, right? Yeah, yeah. and um, <laughs> you know how how zero trust has evolved from least privilege is in the manner that you mentioned, which is the continuous monitoring and the mindset that. Uh, we have uh, everything is potentially malicious, uh, regardless if it's in the internal network or external network, rather if it's internal or a third party vendor, right? Everything is assumed to be malicious. So it must have constant re-verification or authorization uh, to determine privileged status, right? So that's the difference thing is some it's a it's an inherent mistrust, right, of uh, access, regardless of the entity or object, as you mentioned. So, um, yeah, really great job there. Uh, let's get straight to it and, and tap into your subject matter uh, expertise. Um, <clears throat> Abhishek, tell me from a authorization perspective, how is zero trust applicable? And I know we hit on it a little bit more but can you narrow down how zero trust operates off, uh, off authorization? Yeah, uh, so thanks for that question, Odi. Uh, actually, I would uh, like to answer that question jointly with Arun, because mostly these days people are revolving their target application as their cloud, uh, their cloud applications as uh, platforms as their target applications mostly, right? So those are the most complex uh, structures which people are managing. So I would, uh, you know, like Arun to kind of uh, first explain uh, us that, you know, if, if that's okay with you, that how, what does least privilege access control means for cloud uh, infrastructure? Because that will also, you know, help me to shape my answer on authorization overall. Mm -hmm. uh, so Arun, can you please uh, educate us on like, what does it mean by uh, applying principle of least privilege in your cloud infrastructure uh, realm. So if you see like Abhishek, like uh, the, the cloud environment are you know, being like very complicated, like that means like we have uh, multiple accounts, we have, you know, uh, you know, various platforms. So each and every platform is managing is very difficult, right? So even like, so we call like uh, IDP, like uh, any IDP provider, we can uh, manage entire platform in one IDP provider, right? So in this concept, like the least privilege is a very important, like uh, when users are given uh, more rights than they needed. So it means like, uh, so some users might over provision like certain window. So we are not revalidate or, you know, uh, we considered like what exact permission they needed, right? So in this case, like every, uh, so for the best practices, what I suggest is every time, like when you provide an access, we have to go with the least privilege, uh, least privilege what exactly the project requirement is. And then based on that, you know, we should not give up over permission to, uh, to give the you know more access to the users so that they can you know do whatever they want and also they can able to control the other resources as well right so so that you know like the, one of the best practice i also say like every uh you know certain window you have to revalidate the privileges so that you know we can keep an attract who uh, who access for what you know? right yep so uh, thank you for that. Uh, so thank you for providing me that platform to answer uh, Odi's question, right? With uh, like, what does zero trust means in realm of uh, authorization, right? So, you know, let's start with, uh, you know, as Odi, you rightly said that least privilege uh, could be called as grandfather of zero trust. But uh, I, in my experience so far, I have not seen um, you know, one particular proper implementation of least privilege and to end which could be claimed as like, you know, this is a very satisfactory implementation of least privilege access control. People mm -hmm. are, uh, you know, chronically suffering from 
uh, over provisioned of over provisioning of excess or mm. under provisioning of excess right mm -hmm. so to understand uh, the ideology of zero trust it is also important to understand why we want to do it it is not just because of the pandemic thing or it is not because of the you know shift in working style uh, it was much needed before it's just that you know pandemic has triggered the importance or critical nature of the whole concept right so yeah. if uh, if it is okay uh, you know if uh, if that's fine then i would like to kind of quickly uh, review the definition of least privilege access control and how it is implemented or how it should be implemented right so uh, the principle polp or principle least privilege access control says that you know everybody in an enterprise should have minimum level of access they need to get their job done right and in order to apply uh, principle of least privilege access control uh, you know people uh, like we need to identify the resources and action that each need uh, user needs to in order to perform their job uh, we need to assign and roles uh, assign roles or permissions to each user based on their job responsibilities and as soon as their job responsibility changes we need to make sure that we take away the uh, you know previously granted permissions and grant them new or provision the new permissions right but from the whole equation the whole understanding of the landscape or the scope of responsibilities is is missing right uh, is missing so in uh, now coming to the reason why i said that because uh, you know in authorization the strongest way to achieve zero trust uh, implement zero trust architecture principles are you know to uh, make sure that your users your access your data uh, are you know governed properly right so uh, you know you are monitoring your users or governing your users you are managing your access properly and access is uh, you know access to the data uh, is very important like what kind of data it is and uh, having that visibility to that uh, factor and the fourth pillar is like you need to understand the reason why that user needs access to this data right so that whole authorization model i mean as satish was earlier mentioning about the controls to implement zero trust right like when you talk about we can divide it our whole organization or enterprise into uh, three different uh, physical uh, categories and one uh, logical category uh, three categories mm -hmm. being user data and uh, user access and data and uh, logical category of reasoning right why so in users category uh, the pillars are uh, you know identity governance then uh, you know you need to understand uh, like, uh, like what what is what are all the attributes of this user right how do you like whether this user is a full time employee uh, like how are you governing the whole life cycle of that user from join a mover lever program right you need to have a centralized identity warehouse for that right and then on top of that you have to make sure that there are strong analytics like strong identity analytics around it it's not just that you are bringing in data and doing a dump of it you have to derive meaningful information out of it as well right and then you have to identify or categorize your critical assets your crown jewels of your organization and then you have to you know make sure all the privilege access management controls are applied around that so that part comes under identity governance or users part and once you come to access part right it is access management and uh, you know in access part also like we have achieved as an industry a lot of uh, we have covered a lot of ground with adaptive authentication we see a lot of fancy uh, uh, startups coming out uh, you know in adaptive authentication uh, realm uh, you see biometrics face detection you know fingerprint detection Uh, retina detection uh, multi factor authentication multiple layers right so the authentication market has really really matured and uh, i mean there's still room for improvement but still it is you know we can say that kind of time we have spent in it and the kind of output we have received is a satisfactory approach right but uh, now what about uh, adaptive authorization that part is still missing people are mm. still creating request for access manually mm. people are still uh, you know approving requests manually you still are pushing your end users 
who actually do not want to deal with your security tools and security team you are forcing them every quarter or mm-hmm. every year to review millions of line items for access certifications right and you yes. are putting the sword of uh, you know uh, compliance on their throat to actually get it done and they leave their productive job mm-hmm. which actually make dollars for your company to do all this manual reviews in excel sheet and no matter how mm-hmm. fancy tools you are buying right this t- this thing is still there and nobody likes it but you got to have to do it because it's a compliance requirement right and now uh once you are done with that uh, yeah. or once it, yeah i agree and now Audi, you oh, apologize i didn't mean to interrupt continue no Audi, i think your video uh, and audio are a little bit flaky I think your network side is kind of. Oh, can uh, you hear me? We now. It, we can, but it's like very flaky, and it's better now. It's better. Yeah, it's better. My apologies, team. I was just commending you on that incredible breakdown. Uh, and to your point, if you have observed that least privilege has not been appropriately practiced, then of course, inherently, zero trust has not been practiced by standard and it requires that scalability of authorization and truly the biggest risk to the zero trust model is new data right is new data new devices things of that nature because if you do not have a reactive uh, 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 uh reactive process to your degree that's not manual that somehow is able, and maybe this is where machine learning will come into play. Maybe this is where AI will come into play, where uh, you can set a rule set, right? A manager can set a rule set based on access, and AI can uh, kind of make determinations on its own to say, well, this person reasonably would need access to this data to perform X function, right? That is the world where zero trust will actually exist and actually be of value. Right now, yeah. in my opinion, it's more theory than practice, right? Yep. But you've made excellent, excellent points about zero trust. As a consultant, I've seen so much manual requests for onboarding, for offboarding, leading to ghost users right that never successfully offboarded so there's these accounts with privileges just sitting in the environment right um and you know there's no one actively monitoring those accounts unless you have a great uh audit of iam which not all organizations do unfortunately so these are un i mean these are risks that are not even known to an organization right but i'll yeah. pause i'll pause there is I would like to hear uh, from Satish regarding uh, how zero trust, some best practices to implement zero trust in enterprise architecture. Um, sure, definitely. So uh, before going there, um, I'll just uh, tie all the dots. Uh, 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 I'll just give an example. So whatever uh, Abhishek spoke and whatever Arun spoke. Um, so I'll just... Uh, 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 I all the dots and then with uh, with a small example. So um, let's take a healthcare system. Um, maybe a healthcare system, a hospital. You have uh, employees. They have they'll be accessing patient data. So let let's take this example. Now, how do you implement zero trust least privilege in this environment? So ideally, uh, uh, so when you say employees, there could be doctors. There could be there could be uh, guards, there could be nurses. So um, so is it okay to give access for patients' data for everybody? No, right? So uh, if you're applying least privileges, then you would uh, definitely give to the doctor, right? I mean, doctor will have access to the patient records. And to some extent, uh, nurse, uh, uh, they might have uh, access, but not so much as doctors. Now, how do you uh, implement zero trust privilege access to this? So let us talk about it. So that is normal privilege access, right? Uh, in the books, 
Now, when it comes to zero trust privilege access, how do you implement it? So the difference is you do the same protection. Uh, that is, you provide least uh, access. Along with that, um, for example, now doctors, entire, all the doctors will be having a, it kind of a block assignment, uh, having access to the data. Now let's split only uh, the doctor who has who takes care of a certain patient, only he should have access. So you should start uh, splitting at a uh, um, macro level. And then also ensure, how do you uh, also ensure the monitoring? Uh, it also means that the same doctor uh, has the access to the, the same patient's data. I mean, a different doctor should be not able to access it. So that needs to be monitored, uh, monitored and ensured that nobody else will try to access that data. So, so in the organization, whenever I get uh, uh, design reviews for these things, uh, the way uh, I would look at it is I'll start from authentication piece. So uh, identity plays a very important role, uh, a very important role and identity should be verified often. For example, um, for example, uh, let's take an example uh, of uh, a remote user who is using uh, the company laptop. He loses the laptop. So now, uh, and somehow uh, the person who has got the laptop, he is able to access the data. Now, how do you verify, how does Zero Trust solve the situation? So the way uh, we advise, the way we advise is, so there should be a time-based uh, time based approach. So every hourly once it has to check, uh, uh, hourly once could be an overhead, but, uh, at least uh, there should be a hard limit where he has to enter the credentials again, right? If he is a person who does not, uh, he, he might have, uh, uh, he might have uh, taken the laptop, but uh, he will not remember the user credentials, right? So authentication uh, on a timely base needs to be verified. That is number one. And uh, automation. So zero trust, uh, clearly says that automation, I mean, all these mechanisms should be via automation. You need to try use automation. So a single sign on things like that would definitely, uh, would definitely help. So we ask the product teams who develop to implement these things. Uh, um, and least privilege, we uh, try to um, enforce a least privilege. Only access should be provided at a certain time only for the uh, certain people who is required. And after that, automatically it has to be revoked. So time-based access uh, is what I'm talking about. Um, that is one we try to, we try to ask the product teams to implement. Um, then uh, at the networking side, uh, we ask them to, uh, we ask them to uh, do a lot of things like um, segmentation. So, we ask them to split uh, uh, split their data uh, into a separate network and then have multiple networks. Um, so in order to reach the data, uh, the uh, uh, data where the uh, data network, they need to cross multiple like DMZ and it could be uh, various other things to reach there. So we ask them to put multiple gates to reach to the data. So that is network, network segmentation. We highly recommend uh, them to implement. Um, yes, these are some of the things. And logging and monitoring, that, that plays a crucial role. And uh, there should be somebody uh, watching uh, all the time, uh, the data monitoring. Uh, if there is any logs, which is uh, doesn't look right. So those needs to be uh, response uh, responded properly. So these are some of the things uh, throughout enterprise we recommend the product teams to implement uh, with respect to zero trust. Thank you for sharing. Um, the next question will go to Arun, and this is regarding if if you can help the audience understand what are some potential challenges organizations might face 
when implementing uh, zero trust in cloud environments? So it's a great question, Orik. Like uh, basically, like when you implement the zero trust, like first one is cross collaboration between the team, right? Right. So we have mm -hmm. a different team. So if you ask any team members, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, if you are from technical, I mean, security team, if you go with a different team to revoke your access or, uh, or else you know reduce, I mean, uh, limit your access. The people not understand the you know uh, why we are you know limit the access they just want to have a, a extreme level of access to run the operation but that is not a case like as a security expert as a cloud expert we need our infrastructure as to be secure and monitorable as well as very least privileged you know uh, what you know, certain access has to be provided to the uh, to the, the daily work right so this cross collaboration is a only main one one of the main uh, uh, complication I face like uh, in the in my past and also like in the Satish mentioned like like couple of items about you know how we can implement the uh, zero trust right so one of the uh, one of the point I just I like to add uh, here like uh, we have a condition based access policies okay so for example. Uh, if somebody like if someone are trying to access the users, I mean trying to access the application for certain lo location. So if it's certain like if it's a particular on that location, we have to go with the single sign-on method. If somebody unauthorized to access from different location, they have to block or you know revoke the access for the users to until they revalidate. I mean revalidate the users. They are the trusted users. Then only we have to you know allow the users to log into the application so that we we know who is accessing from where, right? That's the way we can protect our application as well as protect our infrastructure in a zero trust manner. Thank you for sharing, uh, Abhishek. I'm going to give you the first uh, stab at probably my favorite question of the night, which is how do you convince leadership to <laughs> Increase your cybersecurity budget to employ least privilege more efficiently and effectively. Um, well, that's a <laughs> that's a very uh, tough one. So it depends on person to person. Loaded, loaded question. <laughs> loaded question. <laughs> right. So, see, leaders. Uh, unfortunately, uh, security teams or security orgs are still considered as expense houses, right? They are, uh, until unless you are in a security service company or a security product company, uh, the organization gonna look at the security teams as, uh, you know, a source of uh, losing money, right? But uh, the good part is that, uh, especially after, you know, bunch of events like, uh, I mean, events were unfortunate, but their output was like at one of the output was, uh, you know, that people got a wake up call. Uh, for example, like Solar Winds, Satish was mentioning about and Log4j event incident and all that happened, right? Uh, and all the insider threats which companies are facing these days, which you were mentioning OD before, right? And as Arun was mentioning, the complex uh, uh, peripheral uh, understanding of cloud architecture, uh, right? And the kind of landscape and volume you are dealing with right uh, so leadership is understanding these days that it is better to spend in more offensive approaches than defensive approaches because since everything is virtual and so remote they won't even realize by the time their disaster recovery and threat detection thing gonna kick in it's gonna be too late right so i mean reactive approach are the talks of you know early 2000s or uh, you know, kind of uh, those eras. But uh, now you're talking about, uh, you know, within fractions of minutes, the whole data is getting leaked out, right? And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it is, to begin with, it is so difficult to inventorize your cron jewels because there are so many, right? Your critical access is so many. It is like, uh, you know, your privilege access management uh, inventory is more populated and loaded than your IAM inventory from last 10 uh, which was your IAM inventory 10 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. So, and then, you know, but they all understand money. They all understand mm -hmm. money talk, 
right mm-hmm. so if you have a way of educating them by doing so uh, you are going to save x amount of dollars every year or every quarter they will listen i mean if they are in their sanitized mindset they should listen right mm-hmm. and uh, for example arun was talking about uh, over provisioning of access and all those things are a problem right so let's just look at uh, like uh, you apply least privilege access control uh, as a part of zero trust architectural uh, approach right which solves your problem of over provisioning of access and under provisioning of access so let's for the sake of answering this question pick over provisioning of access um there it was a report last year uh, i don't know the facts and truths behind that report but it was published in a, on a public platform so i would then honor that that somebody let it publish so it said uh, that you know there was around uh, you know there was around uh, i mean there was some numbers that there was like x amount of uh, you know some 100, uh, 200 300 billion uh, cloud waste expense last year in united states right and 67% uh, of that uh, came out to be majorly because of over provisioning of access and unfortunately when you talk with uh, leadership these days right uh, they might even even not acknowledge that over provisioning of access is a problem because their business continuity is happening right and everybody is just you know focused on migrating to cloud migrating to cloud right and they have been ignoring that all these things are coming along with the cloud it's a package right the cloud comes with its own baggage it's not as simple right so it's uh, you know the reasoning why you want to migrate to cloud has to be very crystal clear right and the critical inventorization or cataloging of your assets in the cloud is more critical right but you have a an s3 bucket you store ssn of your customers in that s3 bucket today right one month down the lane you remove all that data is not critical anymore so you have to figure out a way to understand that right if you are able to give give these levels of uh, visibilities to your uh, you know leadership right and if you are able to translate that okay we wasted 67% of our revenue in aws bill last year just because of over provisioning of access if we do this or if we apply this control we will be able to save 10% of the cost right at only and we're going to be spending only 2% of the money which we will be saving so there is an 8% profit overall or savings in aws bill uh, in the whole year right so i don't understand why they should not be uh, you know letting us do it but you have to be like come with the numbers like you cannot just throw like i want to apply zero trust architecture because it is the thing i i want to buy uh, apply artificial intelligence right in my shoes because it's a thing right it, i mean it's not a thing you have to convert that into dollar amount does that answer your question it does thoroughly at that and um <clears throat> it's interesting a few notes you said that they must have a sanitized mind unfortunately we really have the scenario <laughs> where their their mind is uh not uh preoccupied on anything but um you know if anything lowering the cybersecurity budget but uh the the phrase i like to use is spend money to save costs <laughs> right and, and i always get a puzzled look spend money save costs yes spend the money now to save the cost later I would say there is a 90% uh if you are in a large enterprise organization there are areas of cost reduction you can trim uh off your budget as it relates to technology there are su- subscriptions underutilized there is technology underutilized you probably have a SaaS product that only five people use that you're paying tier top dollar on and you probably contracted out for that so um investigate understand how you can trim cost by reducing waste and leverage that as your pot of money uh for your particular initiative as it relates to leaves privilege then make the case on how this implementation will reduce risk of uh potential 
regulatory compliance fines are data breaches. Because again, I, I, I re-echo my point from earlier, insider threat is quickly becoming one of the biggest risk areas in cybersecurity uh, alongside third party risk, right? So preparing your organization uh, for that area of risk to make sure that you are sound and monitored and you're proactively addressing it, it's going to make you look like a rock star, especially if you leave the conversation with saying, hey, here goes a series of apps that have less than 25% utilization, yet we're paying X amount of dollars um, you know, in expenses, which can be reallocated to this least privileged project that will then reduce our risk uh, exposure by 50%. That kind of conversation uh, will get uh, the attention of real leadership and, and begin to sanitize that mind, as you mentioned, uh, Abhishek. Uh, but uh, Arun Satish, do you have any thoughts of your own on the topic? Yeah, I think uh, Abhishek covered it well. Um, um, yeah, definitely with the leadership team, uh, you need to go with all the facts. Um, and based on the current situation, uh, looks like uh, um, that will be in line with whatever you provide the details. So, but yeah, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, I think uh, Abhishek covered it well in the table. Exactly. So, so, so the security aspect. So we can compromise. Uh, I mean, we can compromise in saving the cost in workload or whatever, right? But in a security aspect, we cannot compromise. We have to be more secure. It's like each and every data has to be more valuable than the money, right? So we have to more secure. That's the way we can give the confidence to our customers as well as the data inside of our base. So each of you, can you provide a real world example of employing least privilege and some areas of why it was effective in its uh, practice and why it benefited the organization? We'll start with Abhishek. Okay, so Odi, can I please provide an example of where least privilege was not implemented? Because the question you asked was like kind of unreal. Yeah, yeah, I haven't seen that example. <laughs> I haven't seen that implementation yet, right? So, um, so I was I won't name the customer. It was a giant uh, organization, very uh, mature organization, with like uh, you know user count more for more than like uh, touching around hundred thousand users, right? So. I was talking about, uh, you know, how do you manage access in your cloud? And they said like, oh, you know, we have very vast extensive usage of cloud. We are aggressively migrating data to AWS and all that. Like, okay, fine. Um, but how do you manage access? So th they said that we create account, independent account for every department and every team, right? So let's say there are 50 departments in that company in one location. So there are 50 AWS accounts. And this is unfortunately, they said like, I don't know the truth or fact behind it, but they said like, this is an agreed upon approach. Uh, you know, kind of with the, this is an agreed upon, upon approach with AWS folks. Uh, I was flabbergasted by what they suggested. They say like, we create independent uh, accounts uh, with uh, independent teams. And then in that team, we give admin access to everybody. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then we have a tool which measures the budget, right? If your uh, usage of AWS goes beyond X amount of dollar in that particular uh, month, right? It will cut down. Uh, it will like uh, deactivate the account for that team for that particular rest of the days for that month. So this is like, you know, uh, you're hurting business continuity and you are giving admin access to everybody which is amazing it's like such a smooth thing thing to do right the best thing to do uh, i was being sarcastic over there just in case if uh, you know people listening later online doesn't get it so uh, but uh, you know that was the uh, i just dropped my conversation after that like there's no point in selling things here right let them uh, you know go through the journey and then realize 
before uh, it's too late right but then uh, these are the things which people are doing in real world and that's the these are the companies where your financial systems and credit cards and everybody is sitting right yes. just imagine how things are operating and they were claiming that you know uh, the providers are uh, aware of this and they are actually advocating this yes that is that is too tr- too true i have seen that my example was modified a bit from yours because there was one departmental account that everyone had the the password to and it was an admin account. Yep. I said, what is going on here? <laughs> some, some fancy stuff going on. Yeah, yeah, really. Okay, next uh, for Arun. So, yeah, so Satish, you can go ahead, like I can catch up from you. Yeah, one of the example I could think of is, um, again, I think I did bring this up during this uh, call. Um, that is the laptops and uh, the mobile phone. So what will happen if you lose them, right? And uh, a lot of people lose them. So unless, and, uh, uh, and the, it is possible to break in also. And then once you try to, uh, if, if, if the credentials are very easy to guess, uh, if you are into the network, you get access to everything. So, um, so this is where we, we looked at uh, seriously and then zero trust least privilege is what we uh, we went ahead with and then especially the time based uh, access so it it played a major role uh, by uh, locking the account uh, if the validation doesn't um, i mean if they need to uh, validate and that is one and se- the second thing is uh, um, it automatically, uh, if somebody uh, says that uh, something is lost, automatically it has to remove all the accesses immediately, all the privileges. So we we went ahead and did that. So we solved the issue. Thank you, Satish. Arun, do you have anything? Yeah, so one thing as Satish mentioned, right, like uh, the time-based access will be given more insight to the, you know, the, uh, to the uh, least privilege access. So if somebody needs a, uh, I mean, admin level of access or whatever, right? So they need a certain window that they should not require for the entire their life. So if you pro, if you be, if you provide an access, I mean, privilege access for the certain window, they can do their operation and then they can work on, you know, uh, they can uh, they can come back like uh, they can come back to the normal role. Then they can do the daily operation. They don't need to be retain a privilege access for all the time. Thank you. Thank you. Odi, so we'll go- uh, one small request we can ask, uh, we can give, I think we have just five minutes. We can ask uh, somebody from the audience if they have any questions we can answer. Okay. Yeah. Is there anyone uh, that has joined us in the audience that has a question for the panel? All right. While well, we are waiting on a question from the audience, We'll go ahead and uh, have final insights from the panel, uh, starting with Abhishek. Do you have um, any final insights as it relates to least privilege and zero trust? See, my experience is that every organization is different, right? So there is uh, like everybody uh, running behind the buzzwords and all that. But it is important to, you know, for the board of the company to work together and, you know, understand the priorities of their company. Um, you know, the positive thing which is happening is that people have started adding CISOs to the board and started calling security professionals to the board meeting. So these strategies are becoming critical. So I would just like to request, you know, uh, don't trust uh, like, you know, the whole activity or user activity which is happening in your company, but have a little bit more trust in your security team that they mean good. And, you know, they're trying to safeguard uh, you know, your crown jewels. So there will be no business uh, left to grow or to uh, save if, you know, it gets impacted badly. So, I mean, this these are essential parts of the business. So I would just like to, you know, request the community, uh, especially the tech community to kind of, you know, have more uh, faith in the security teams. 
as a cyber guy, that's music to my ears. And we all vote you to be chair of the board now, Abhishek. <laughs> okay, Satish, how about you? Any final insights? Yeah, what I see is um, zero trust concept as a, we need to simplify this better because uh, it is quite complex. It's not easy to understand. Even I took quite a while to understand what exactly is zero trust model, what is zero trust. Uh, I mean, although everybody knows about zero trust, we need to simplify it much better, especially uh, for the leadership team. They should be able to understand uh, uh, the nuances better. They should be able to uh, know the importance of it. So uh, things like uh, spreading the knowledge, like what we are doing, um, uh, the fireside chat, and uh, uh, simplifying uh, the zero trust and helping them understand uh, what what is the crux of the issue and how it could be solved by zero zero trust model uh, it could be it will go a long way. So yeah, with that, I would like to. Hey, we have a question that came in from the audience, so from Yamanish. The question is, in the implementation of zero trust in operational health monitoring, can data visualization or building machine learning be useful? Uh, what could be some good use cases that can support the implementation? That final question, uh, that, that last question is, 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 is tough but I'll just give a crack at it and say, yes, I think data visualizations and dashboards at, equipped with machine learning could be quite effective uh, for at least privilege, but uh, I don't have any use cases offhand, so I'll pass it to our expert panel to see if you have any uh, use cases in mind for that. Arun, do you wanna take that? So, yeah, so uh, if you see like um, many of the tools are they are using like machine learning to visualization that what are the, and they means they are scanning the entire organization IDPs and then monitoring the in and out, what are the traffic getting in or what are the, you know, un unauthorized access getting in, all visualized and showing it on the monitoring. So that the way we can able to identify what are the risk or what are the daily risk, what are the weekly risk. So based on that, we can tune and modify the infrastructure depend on the policy or whatever. Mm -hmm. So do you want to go ahead, Abhishek? Anything yeah, no, thank you, that's, that's good enough. Uh, that addresses a lot, very important use case. Uh, Yaminish, I hope uh, that answers your question for you. And uh, yeah, thank, Odi, thank you. Yeah, that helps. Thank you. Uh, Odi, I want to take a couple of minutes to talk about you and your effort as well, if that's okay. Right. So, Odi here, he is an army veteran, right? And he is a very seasoned cybersecurity professional, as you guys must have, uh, you know, uh, figured it out by now. And, uh, you know, I just wanted to thank Odi for joining us from his busy schedule. He is, uh, you know, kind of uh, running multiple efforts uh, to, you know, co contribute to this community. Uh, Odi runs his own uh, service company or consulting company with securities, uh, cyber security. And, but the major, uh, you know, thing which connected us with Odi was that he uh, runs uh, Diversity Global. Uh, organization. It's a non-profit organization. Uh, and then they, uh, you know, teach uh, underprivileged section of the society and the community about cybersecurity techniques, help them prepare for uh, the certifications and, you know, help them to get uh, placed in cybersecurity related jobs, which I believe is a very noble way of doing things. All right. So, Odi, why don't you take a couple of minutes and, you know, educate us a little bit about your effort with Diversity Global. That might be one of the best introductions that I've had. Uh, so thank you, Abhishek. And yes, uh, it is our mission to uh, train residents of underserved communities uh, to enter the cybersecurity and technology workforce. We have a few different technology workforce development programs. And uh, our goal is to be able to establish a sustainable and diverse talent pipeline uh, to the workforce. We welcome uh, global scholars uh, as all our programs are virtual based. We do have scholarships to uh, provide uh, to uh, Google Coursera uh, tech programs. 
So if you are interested, I will go ahead and type our site in the chat now. Feel free to share with a friend or a few friends. And uh, ultimately, we are uh, welcoming instructors and mentors to join our mission um, to be able to, um, to help people in need, ultimately, because technology is the foundation of business now, right? Uh, technology is industry agnostic. Uh, in order to remain employable, you must know technology skills. So uh, I believe we can best serve this demand by uh, being a community that serves the community. So uh, thank you for the time and thank you for allowing me to be a moderator. Thank you. Thank you for very much, Odi. And thank you, Satish, for organizing this. And it was really fun and interesting. Uh, and I hope we get to do this again. And thank you, everybody who joined. So, Zatish, over to you for the final remarks. Thanks, everybody, uh, for joining, especially from the audience, uh, taking time and joining this. Really appreciate it. Um, and uh, for all the people uh, <laughs> uh, in the discussion, in the panel, definitely thank you so much for uh, making this happen. Uh, for the support chapter. Thank you. Thank you, Take guys. Care. Take care.